Good day, everybody. This is Chris back again with the Ancient Scholar, and uh, what I'd like to talk about this week in terms of chemical weapons is a class of chemical um, agents that can be broadly defined as incapacitating agents. And basically, incapacitating agents are agents that cause incapacitation as opposed to death. Now, that's not to say that these particular agents are um, without risks. They, they certainly are. Um, they can certainly cause death, but that's not primarily what they were designed to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So incapacitating agents can fall into a large number of categories. They can include things such as the, the opioids. Um, we saw opioids used in uh, 2002 by um, the Russians um, in a, a, a hostage crisis in a theater involving uh, several hundred, 600 or more hostages um, or in a theater, explosives were involved, and eventually the, what we think happened was the, the, um, the military pumped a um, opioid gas, probably related to fentanyl, into the theater. And um, while it did resolve the crisis, it incapacitated everybody in the theater. Um, the, the, um, the side effects of the, the um, central nervous system side effects of the, uh, the fentanyl-like substance um, ended up causing the deaths of over 100 uh, people. Um, so there's pretty substantial um, collateral damage uh, involved there. And that really, when we look at all the incapacitating agents or potent candidates for incapacitating agents, they really do have a lot of pitfalls. Some of them can be highly toxic. Um, there's a lot of experimentation that went on in the 50s um, involving uh, psychedelic agents such as your, your indole alkalamines like uh, LSD and um, your, um, uh, your substituted amphetamines like mescaline and the, the various derivatives, uh, various derivatives of uh, LSD and um, uh, phencyclidine um, as well. And uh, all the agents really just uh, suffered from, from, it was really hard to uh, disperse these particular psychedelics, um, including opioids. It's really hard to disperse them, um, and they just didn't make really good um, wep the weaponization of the, these particular agents. It just didn't work, just didn't work out very well. Um, and when it came to other agents, such as the um, opioids, for example, the, the opioids, of course, had a fairly narrow therapeutic index. And so, yeah, you could incapacitate somebody with an opioid, but the, the risk of, of killing them was, was very high. So... Um, and then, oh, by about the like, 1950s, um, people were researching with uh, uh, various anticholinergic-like molecules, um, so atropine-like molecules, um, to treat uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting. And one of the particular molecules that came about was this little guy here. And this little guy here is um, known as triquinoclidin. Yeah, <laughs> let me say that again triquinoclidinol benzoate. So um, kind of a handful of words there, but uh, the NATO designation of this particular agent, the triquinoclidinol benzoate, is known as BZ, and that is actually what most people call this particular agent, is uh, BZ by its uh, NATO code. Uh, so BZ here, if we take a look at the molecular structure of it, it looks rather bizarre. But if you remember back to the medicinal chemistry videos I did, this particular area here with this nitrogen and this interesting ring-like structure that exists in a couple different planes should be familiar because this is very familiar to what we saw with the anticholinergics, the very end of um, molecules of uh, scopolamine, atropine, hyoscamine, um, etc. And this is in fact uh, one of the major components of this particular molecule. So basically you have this component here, and then you have this component here, and this is basically just a molecule of um, glycolic acid. And if I were to actually remove this little nitrogen-containing group here, okay, if I were to remove that and put a hydrogen, if I have a hydrogen here, I'll just show you. Okay, if I were to put a hydrogen um, right here in place of that particular group, um, then th that's exactly what I'd have, is I would have um, glycolic acid. Um, in fact, glycolic acid is a carboxyl. You have a, a C double bond OOH, COOH group, which makes this a carboxylic acid. And, of course, 
it can donate its hydrogen ion or proton, and that's then this becomes an, an ion. So this, you know, hey, this this is pretty well known. Um, but when we substitute the hydrogen for these carbon plane system here that contains the nitrogen, that's where we get the BZ molecule. So the BZ molecule has a very potent anticholinergic activities. It uh, primarily uh, focuses in, in on um, antagonizing acetylcholine at um, the muscarinic receptor sites. So this is a very strong muscarinic antagonist, not so much nicotinic um, receptors. So this binds to the receptor and prevents acetylcholine from coming in. So what it does is it, it blocks the parasympathetic nervous system. So uh, its peripheral effects are, are pretty characteristic when you talk about um, midriasis, dilation of the eyes. Some people say that these people are blind as a bat. Um, they can get xerostoma, dry, a really drying uh, of the mucous membranes and mouth out. And this is where the term dry as a bone may come from. Um, they're going to have pretty marked uh, reduction in uh, GI um, mucosal uh, secretions and motility. Um, just like you have a drying of the mouth or xerostoma, you can get uh, drying of the other gastrointestinal secretions. Um, your skin can get red and flushed, may even get a little, little hot. That's a, you know, just classic, classic anticholinergic toxidrome findings here in, in addition to um, uh, inability or difficulty urinating. Um, so those, those signs and symptoms of them themselves may or may not be particularly incapacitating, but what is really unique with BZ is the fact that it does have central nervous system penetration and it antagonizes cholinergic receptors in the central nervous system. Um, we see a kind of a dose, um, a, a pretty reliable dose response curve, and that is to say the larger the exposure to this agent, the more profound we ha central nervous system effects we have. And just like when we talk about uh, anticholinergic toxidrome, the, these pe people that have anticholinergic toxicities can present with pretty marked um, CNS um, uh, side effects. Um, for example, you can have a depression of the uh, level of consciousness. You can de depress the level of consciousness and um, even um, complete unresponsiveness with exposure to BZ in particular. Um, you can also have hallucinations, and these hallucinations tend to be very different from the hallucinations that are associated with the endol alkalamines, like LSD and uh, um, in, in uh, dimethyltryptamine and uh, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine and uh, um, even the substituted amphetamines, uh, which tend to exert their action through the uh, serotonin uh, or the 5-hydroxytryptamine um, A2, 5-HTA2 uh, or 2A excuse me, 2A subreceptor uh, or subtype of serotonin receptors in addition to a myriad of other receptors. But what we find with the, the indol alkalamines, your more traditional psychedelics, is that the, the experience tends to be very difficult for patients to describe. They, they tend to see a lot of um, uh, different colors and they can develop synesthesia where they have a, a blending of the senses. They can see sounds and... Um, um, smell colors and that that kind of thing can happen and they also also have very um, repeating geometric kinds of patterns that are very difficult for these patients to describe that is not at all what we find with the um, hallucinations that occur with um, the patients that are exposed to anticholinergics the hallucinations tend to be a bit more a bit more realistic if you will um, there's still hallucinations, still responding to stimuli that is, is not uh, present in the, the shared reality that other people have. Um, but the, this, the, the, the hallucinations tend to be a bit more realistic, like a, a real person perhaps, that you're, you're somebody that you knew or know that you're talking to, or some uh, fairly easy to identify phenomena is occurring that's causing the hallucination. Um, these people may see things uh, growing and they may pick at them. Some people even call it like wool picking um, as, as well. But the hallucination, the hallucinatory experience does tend to be very different than the indol alkalamines. Um, and you have a depressed uh, level of consciousness. And again, there's a pretty, pretty, pretty decent dose response curve that occurs here. Um, 
And interesting thing about BZ exposure is the central nervous system effects tend to be delayed. They can be delayed. Uh, you can have a prodromal uh, period of, of, of several hours in some case um, before you actually develop the central nervous system uh, signs and symptoms, uh, which is, is very interesting. And I, I'm not quite sure of the, the reason why. I assume that it takes some time for the molecule to penetrate into the central nervous system. Um, you do have some rather polar regions on here and some nonpolar regions, so maybe there's some sort of metabolism that goes on or it just there's some sort of transporter that it needs to interact with to get into the central nervous system. I'm not entirely sure, to be, to be quite honest, but uh, that would be my guess when, when, if it comes down to it. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, there we go. BZ is pretty potent. Um, according to my reading or my notes, um, looking at a, about one milligram of exposure to BZ is approximately equivalent to 12 to 15 milligrams of atropine exposure. So pretty significant atropinergic effects. If you think about it, you get exposed to one milligram and you're going to have something similar to you know, the, you know 10 or more milligrams of atropine. You would certainly expect some pretty pretty marked uh, central nervous system effects. Um, with that said, the, this, this agent does tend to have a, a fairly decent safety profile. And in fact, we actually have something called the incapacitating dose that we can calculate on this. And basically what it is, it's a ratio. It's a ratio between the LD50%, that's the lethal dose uh, 50 and 50% 50 of the population, um, divided by the ED 50%, which is the, uh, the effective dose 50%, whatever kind of effect we're looking at, uh, tends to have a pretty large therapeutic index as well. Um, so the risk of death is certainly much lower, but not, uh, not negligible by any means, um, particularly in patients that may have some sort of underlying um, pathophysiology. So, um, yeah, there you have it. Um, so what do we see? Well, we, we actually see, you know, our onset uh, of our initial signs and symptoms can take up to four hours to occur. Um, your profound central nervous system effects can take, you know, um, over four hours to a day in some cases. And then recovery can take, you know, several days, three, four um, days. And generally people have pretty uh, complete recovery. Um, however, they can present with your classic anticholinergic toxidrome, which can be toxic, can be life-threatening. Um, general treatment, of course, is going to be around, revolve around decontamination. This is, tends to be a solid under, at room temperature, and it can be dispersed as small floating solid particles fairly easily. Um, because it's a solid room temperature, it tends to be very persistent and it can stick around in the environment for a significant or extended period of time. Um, so how do we treat patients? Well, obviously decontaminate them, remove them from the area, get their clothes off of them, secure their ABCs, supportive care, fair enough. Are there, uh, are there any agents that are antidotes? No specific antidotes there. We can actually administer cholinergic agents. Um, in particular, we could administer um, a, the a carbamate, which is something I talked about um, last week, carbamate, uh, which is a nerve agent. Uh, it uh, is a reversible inhibitor of the cholinesterase enzyme. So you can give um, a carbonate to uh, your patient and you can cause um, an increase in acetylcholine. And if you have enough acetylcholine, you might be able to compete with the BZ molecule and uh, alleviate some of the signs and symptoms. Um, there are really two, two agents that people talk about. There's pyrodystigmine and physostigmine. Um, physostigmine really is the preferred agent. And the reason being is pyrodystigmine has a, has a nitrogen, a quaternary nitrogen in it that is positively charged. So it makes that molecule very polar and you don't get good central nervous system penetration with pyrodystigmine. Um, and the problem is, in, in the case of BZ exposure, you have central nervous system effects, so you need to give a cholinergic that can rapidly, easily penetrate the central nervous system. So uh, physostigmine tends to be much less polar than pyrodystigmine. It can penetrate into the central nervous system and uh, it can exert its um, effects. Generally, you give it slow, very slow pushes, you titrate 
um, to your uh, patient's response, and you just kind of wait this out. Um, the United States has pretty much gotten rid of all of its, its BZ. It got rid of most of it in the 1980s. And regarding using this particular agent as a, a weapon, uh, you know, there are treaties out there, and it, it's kind of a gray zone because there, there is kind of a, a way of getting around weapons treaties in terms of like, like um, law enforcement, using it in a law enforcement capacity. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a legal gray zone. Obviously, we've seen countries like Russia use uh, not this particular agent, although we think that some, some other countries, uh, you know, I, I, Iraq, for example, probably used uh, something called Agent 15, which, uh, if I had to guess, looking at the, the, the signs and symptoms of the patients that were exposed to this agent, I'd have to guess it's pretty much BZ or some similar, very similar anticholinergic molecule. Um, so, you know, they have been used here and there, and incapacitating agents in general are something to think about. Um, uh, next week, I'll talk about more of the riot control agents, which are incapacitating to a point um, but the, their effects tend to be more irritating to the, the mucous membranes and they cause tearing and, and uh, make your patient, patient uncomfortable. And, you know, the problem with those particular agents is there are, you know, a lot of people that, you know, may be sufficiently motivated that to where um, they may not actually be incapacitated by significant exposure to things like CS, uh, tear gas, and things like that. Um, I remember being in the Army and we did uh, um, pepper spray um, or Oreo resin capskin training. We got sprayed with it and we actually had to um, continue uh, like do a, a fake kind of fight combatives thing after we'd been sprayed. And so it is possible to have some degree of um, some degree uh, some ability to, to perform your mission after you've been exposed to the right control agents. Whereas if you get exposed to sufficient dose of BZ, um, you are going to be very you know, highly incapacitated, particularly with the central nervous system effects. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and cut it off here. Hopefully you found this video interesting, and as always, thanks for hanging in there.